We packed our cameras and brought them to a brand new location. And so far, so good. The wildlife is as rich as ever, and already we've got an impressive cast of characters. There are some newbie stars on the scene, as well as some regular Springwatch favourites. So welcome to a fresh, feisty, fabulous Springwatch! And welcome to Springwatch 2017. After three years of being in Suffolk, we've come down here to the Gloucestershire countryside, to this wonderful Sherborne Park estate, run by the National Trust since 1987. And it's pretty big, 4,106 acres of rolling countryside. All sorts of different habitats. You can see the wet meadows here, the pasture land, all of this open wood pasture down in the valley there, streams and rivers, and of course scattered across it, plenty of woodland too. We've adapted our mission, you might have noted this time, because we've not come to a nature reserve. When you think about our typical watches, we've been to Minsmere, to Innes here, places where everyone spends all of their time just encouraging and developing the place for wildlife alone. But here it's different. This is a working landscape. These are farms. There are people here producing food that we eat. But wildlife is living alongside it, and we've come to explore that relationship to see what's good about it, what's working, what's failing, and how it might improve at some stage in the future. So we've come to make an assessment. We've come to explore rather than just reveal and celebrate. A new challenge, and we're going to rise to it. Where are we doing it? Well, here's the UK. And if you zoom in, you can see Sherborne there relative to Cheltenham, Bristol and Reading. Reading. <laughs> I don't know who chose Reading, but now you know where we are. It's the Cotswolds though, which is so pretty. I feel like I'm in a Jane Austen movie. I yeah, feel like I'm gorgeous. in the wrong show. Well, you don't look like it. <laughs> so, what have we done to this beautiful location? Well, we've rigged and we've bugged it with cables and cameras and sound, of course, so that we can take a peek into the lives of the wonderful wildlife that calls Sherborne its home. So let's have a look at some of those live cameras. First of all, let me say, Spring Watch would not be Spring Watch without these little guys. Blue tits, there they are live. There are nine chicks all doing pretty well so far and they're in a nest box in the woods. Let's have a look at live at another Spring Watch favourite, the Barn Alice. Chris said a lot of this land is arable, so it's perfect location for Barn Owls. Lots of barns around. There are actually five pairs of Barn Owls on the estate, four are on nests. This is the one we've picked to put a live camera on and it's on chicks and an egg. Another regular on Spring Watch is the Swallow. That's in a different barn. There's one of the adults, I think that's the female, and she's on eggs, so hopefully we're going to see those hatch in what the next bird. few look days. Look at, look at the weeks. light reflecting off of the back. Yeah, I know, they're, they're gorgeous colours that you could take them for Stunning, granted, but they, they really are. Look at it, Stephen, looking at us saying, yes, I know sure. you're talking Big about it. Take my shot, well. take my shot, <laughs> yeah. Size of the eyes, <gasps> fantastic. We've also got our cameras on a tiny little chiff-chaff nest. Now, we think there are four chicks inside that nest. Can't be sure yet. They keep sort of popping out, appearing and then disappearing again. Oh, is there a chick just there? It's quite hard to see, it's isn't hard it? to Martin? see, yeah. Yes, it is. Oh, yes, it is. Just, just moving. moving. Just yeah, moving. In the corner. But we'll keep an eye on that and try to find out how many there are. Also, we've got another nest, one of my favourite birds, bullfinch. And here's the female, looking beautiful there, sitting on the eggs. Actually, we've got two chicks, I think, underneath there. A couple of them hatched out. Uh, about four days ago, but we're, we're waiting to see whether the other eggs hatch out. And the male's been very, very proficient. He's coming in, providing her with food, and they've been feeding the little chicks as well. Gorgeous. Now, we're here, we're sitting down, we've settled in nicely, but what is it? What makes this place so special? Spring Watch has got a new home, and this time, we're not on a nature reserve. We're in the heart of the great British countryside. There's a wonderful mix of habitats here. And these woodlands are home to some of our most iconic animal species. Two rivers run through the estate and they are rich in wildlife. A 
and the surrounding water meadows provide a rare habitat for a variety of unique plants and insects. Part of the estate was commandeered as an airbase during the Second World War, but now it's being reclaimed by nature. And the surrounding farmland boasts an array of some of our rarest species. In the middle of it all, a picture-perfect village plays host to some of the nation's favourite animals. Welcome to the Cotswolds! Welcome to Sherbourne! We've been rummaging around for a few days. Is my favourite thing so far? What's that? The trees. Trees? trees. Some like trees. Well, no, there's some fantastic trees here. Absolutely beautiful. Chestnuts here. Look, we've got these beech and lime. And on the other side there, I found an oak yesterday. Massive, huge girth. Been there for hundreds of years. If trees could talk, eh? Well, probably tell you quite a lot of boring things to stand in the field <laughs> looking at sheep most of the time for hundreds of years just looking at sheep. Anyway, let's move on. Uh, we've got a new location, but we've also got a new member in our team, Gillian Burke. Thank you, Chris. It is amazing to be here. I've been absolutely chomping at the bit to get going because later in the programme, I'm going to be looking at a spring spectacle that happened just a few days ago right here at this beautiful river. Fantastic. We'll be back to Gillian soon. Now, let's have a closer look at some of our nests. They said it couldn't be done. They Corvids, did. crows are notoriously difficult to get cameras on because they're very, very shy. And as soon as you get anywhere near the nest, we can't get cameras on them. But this year, we have. Let's have a look at the site now of this nest. You can see that's the, the camera up there. It's in a spruce tree, the nest. But unfortunately, it's right at the end of one of the branches. Can you see what they are? It's a jay's nest. Now, we've been following that jay's nest. I was here when they got it. They, nobody thought we'd be able to do it. They all said, oh, no, we, we'll never get it. But we did, we did. So let's have a look. Let's catch up with what's been going on at the nest. Now, you may notice something slightly worrying, because that whole nest is at an angle of about, well, I'm not sure, but those chicks are in danger of falling out of the nest. The adults have been very solicitous. They're coming and feeding the chicks. They feed them on a mixture of beetles and caterpillars, fruit and seeds. But the nest itself, as the chicks are getting bigger, is tilting more and more. And now watch this. The chicks are really starting to slither down the nest. <laughs> oh, no! And then having to scrabble back up over there. And then the other day, the wind got up and we were seriously worried. I mean... Crows are meant to be highly intelligent. Let's go live to the nest now, see if it's still there. It is. And there's one of the adults. Very difficult to tell if it's a male or female. Those chicks are now so big that I think they're going to go at any time. I would say possibly in the next couple of days. But it's a, it's a race against time. Is the nest going to go before the chicks go? Um, it is that a is striking, it's a bit of a pig's it? ear, isn't it, really? That's that a nest, really. Well, that's it's a pig's ear. Call it. <laughs> the worst nest ever. They're meant to be intelligent, as you say. Know, yeah. Maybe they built the nest when the branch was straight and the weight of the chick... I don't think so. Well, I think so. that's... I don't think happened. so. I don't think Maybe so. Maybe they It's just a duff build. They, they, they went to Italy and saw the Leaning Tower of Pisa. I must say, when I'm watching it, you kind of want to do that, don't you? <laughs> the screen. But it's fantastic because it is a first for Spring Watch and we have another first and it's this bird, Red Kites. Now, we regularly see them flying overhead here. Now, remember, this is a bird that made a huge comeback. It was almost extinct in the 1950s in the UK, but thanks to reintroduction programmes and protection, it's now recovered. In fact, the last survey was done in 2013. There were 1,600 pairs, so it's a fantastic success story. The Chilterns in Oxfordshire is their real stronghold, but there are plenty here in the Cotswolds. And I'm going to ask you two a question then. Where do you think they were first recorded breeding in Gloucestershire? Here. Sherbourne, here. Yeah, exactly Sherbourne. right. Mm -hmm. What year was that? 
2013. Okay, you get 10 out of 10, or you looked at we read the notes. notes or something. <laughs> anyway, there are now two to three pairs here. So, obviously, we're really excited that we've been able to get a camera on a nest. Let's have a look at where that nest is. It's actually outside the estate. It's one of the nests in a private woodland high up in the trees. And if you look, this is a bird's eye view. And if you look in the middle of the screen, that's where we're based. So let's have a look at that nest live. There are three chicks in it. And they're three weeks old. That's the adult on the right feeding those three chicks. They're actually looking pretty bedraggled. It's been raining quite a lot here today. That nest, well, I've seen that nest. I didn't think it was that exposed, but clearly the rain is coming through the leaves and getting onto that nest because they are definitely wet. Dried out a little bit, though. Let, let's have a look at what's been happening with them because we're going to be watching those grow. They, they don't fledge until they're about 50, 60 days old, and you can see they're, they're really fluffy there. This was a few days ago. And that's the, the adult coming in, probably feeding it something like a vole, which would have caught itself. But this is unusual because this is the leg of a buzzard. Now, the adult wouldn't catch that itself, wouldn't be able to catch a buzzard, so that's probably carrion, maybe a roadkill. It doesn't look like there's an awful lot of meat on there. And look at that chick, it's going, bring me back a vole. That was absolutely rubbish. <laughs> This is them just yesterday, and you can see already they're changing a lot more feathers, and that's just in a few days. Very sweet shot of the little chick there. Let's say we're going to be able to really see these chicks develop. It was very hot yesterday, so that chick looks rather exhausted. This is the adult coming in. This is the male. Very difficult to tell the difference. It's only relative to the female because it's smaller than the female that you can see the difference. And that's the female coming in, so you can see it's slightly bigger and it's coming in with more prey. So that's going to be a really <coughs> exciting nest to follow. That male looked shifty, didn't he? He looked nervous. He looked a bit he nervous. He looked very nervous. Yeah. When the female came in, he was going, whoa, <laughs> backed off. We've all been Great there. views, though. What a fantastic oh, bird. Fabulous, Great yeah. views into the nest. That's going to be very interesting. Although one of the greatest joys in the countryside for me at this time of year is undoubtedly foxes, fox cubs, if you can find them. Now, in the city, they're generally quite easy to watch. They're used to people. But out here in the countryside, they can be quite shy and wary. One of our cameramen found a vixen and no less than six, maybe even seven, cubs. And here they are, outside of their den, playing around. Sounds like a lot, six or seven. Typically, four or five are born in a litter. But what we know is that if there's a high mortality rate in a population of foxes, the females breeding there will give birth to larger litters. So six or seven, it's not that many. The record, unbelievably, is 13. She's off to do some hunting. It's her that provides most of the food for them. Occasionally, the dog fox will bring some food back. But at this time of year, if you can settle down and watch a group of fox cubs playing like this, it's absolute bliss. Look at this. I say play, but there's a purpose to it. They're establishing a hierarchy here. And in fact, by seven or eight weeks old, which is as old as these animals are, that one makes a mistake and falls in the nettles, um, that hierarchy is probably already established and that will last the rest of their lives. So it might be play, but it's also very, very important. What about that? This one looks a little bit smaller. You see the one there on the right? Mm. Now, it's almost certainly from the same litter. It's unlikely to be mixed litters, i.e. a cub that's come from uh, uh, another female that's given birth, because in the social group of foxes, if a subordinate female gives birth, the dominant one will normally kill the cub. So it's likely that that little one is the runt of the litter, but it seems to be doing OK at the moment. Now, the people at the National Trust who have been keeping an eye on the mammals, a diligent eye on the mammals, obviously, since they've been here, but we wanted to take a more comprehensive look at the whole estate to see which species were here. And to do that, I called in my very good friend, Dr Dawn Scott, from the University of Brighton, and we set out to conduct an up-to-date census. Here we are, Dawn. This is our new home. Pretty spectacular, lots of habitats. Spread out on the map here, you can see all the field systems and the woods and the rivers that run through it. So we'd like to get to know the mammals better, which is why we've dialed D for dawn, and you've turned up with a van full of paraphernalia. So what I'd like to do is focus on three different habitat types. First of all, I'd like to go down to the wetland area. We're going to go into the woodland, yep. and then also I'd be really interested in some of the linear features, some of the stone walls 
Let's go to it. Our first mission is a recce down at the water meadow to look for evidence of aquatic mammals. Yeah, that looked all. Yeah, that's a good one. You can see that fresh cut veg there, can't you? Yeah. The best way to identify water vole activity is to look for their food stores, piles of nibbled reeds with an exact 45 degree angle edge. And of course, what goes in must come out. Here's some very nice fresh poo here, Dawn. Water vole poo par excellence. So what they do is they poo in the same place again and again to reinforce the territory, and this would be a female breeding this time of year. I used to do that myself, Dawn. <laughs> It didn't pay off, I have to tell you, you know. So you've got males encroaching on your territory? I had pl there were males encroaching on my territory the whole time. Mm -hmm. Anyway. <laughs> but it seems it's not just water voles living here. We think we just... Weasel. I got a weasel. <laughs> I got a weasel one. Yeah. And the smell. Yeah. You knew instantly what it was. You never know, do you? You never know. A home range that can reach two kilometers. Mice have eyes. bigger eyes as well, yeah, so these have got small eyes. Oh, the last woodland trap. Our last stop today is a small mammal trap left in the hedgerow. Well, I never. <laughs> Yellow neck mouse. So this is a male. You can see that his testes. Animals. I've seen them bigger than this as well. Stronger, more powerful. The ultimate mouse.
as they bite, they then in the, the venom just sort of trickles down. Yeah, yeah. Have you been bitten by one, Chris? I handled lots, actually, in, in, in the 80s. I used to catch them. Um, I, they never bit me. I never got bitten by one. But apparently, if you do bite, it can hurt. You can actually feel the venom. I want to feel what it feels like. Can you? Just the I sense. can arrange that. Could you? Okay, okay. I'm a member of a club that can arrange that sort of thing. mouse only weigh about eight grams the weight of an eight uh, two p piece incredibly acrobatic live their life oh, wasn't quite so acrobatic that one but they live their lives high up in
think. Um, and that's the male bringing in some food.
mason bee stroking the eyes of a female to calm her down during mating. And if we A particular area if you stroke it they become completely static and I think this might be an example of tonic immobility to do just what you said to make sure that female bee remains at of the earth uh, uh, and, and waitresses are conducting the great In the detail. <laughs> Devil's always in the detail. But the other really, really interesting thing about mayflies, which is actually unique to them, is they have this developmental quirk in their life cycle. Whereas most insects will emerge and have, once they have their
species, not, not, not this species.
He calls to the female to tell her that he has food, but she is not at the nest. but an egg would make an even tastier meal. The jackdaws spot the dramatic return of the female. We've had one a tweet from Belfast Roadster. A positive audience. Very optimistic, <laughs> actually. Let's just hope it's not windy in not the next couple of days. That's go. all I can say. We are running out of time now, but I'd like to show you this before we go. Look at these mayfly. This shows you the abundance of these insects. Now, there was a bit of a breeze.
forgotten. Bye-bye. <laughs>